Hey y'all, and welcome to the Herbal Hour. This week we have an episode all about overcoming stress. What stress is, what causes stress, and how we can adapt to it through using certain herbs called adaptogens, which help our body adapt to stress. With us, we have Grady Nisbet. He's an acupuncturist. Hope you guys enjoy. So Grady, can you tell our listeners, if they haven't heard the last episode with you, uh, what your background is, uh, what do you know about herbs, that kind of thing? Yeah, so I am at Bogdan in naturopathic medical school. We're wrapping up. We're going to graduate together. Um, so we have that common experience. And then prior to the naturopathic medical training, I studied East Asian medicine. So acupuncture, Chinese herbs, a number of bodywork therapies, um, you know, dermal friction techniques. It, it's a big package of modalities. Um, but yeah, so within the herbalism, I mean, that is that is a wide world. And a lot of what we're going to be talking about derives from that training. And then, you know, Bogdan and I have had an extension of that through more of a Western lens. Although, you know, it's you can't separate the two, the energetic components of the herbs. And we'll get into that in more detail. For sure. So let's just jump straight into it. Yeah. For anyone who's maybe heard the phrase, it's it's pretty popular these days, uh, adaptogens, things like that. Yeah, I think Let's, it's getting more popular. I mean, and that's a good thing. Right. That seems to show known. that they work. So what are adaptogens? Why is that even a class of herbs? And what are they supposed to do in yeah. your understanding? Well, um, research as far as uh, the experience of stress physiologically uh, is maybe a hundred years old, there was, I think he was an Austrian. His name is Hans Sillier. Mm -hmm. um, and what he, and I forget the context, but it might've been with um, soldiers who were convalescing from like wounds from the first world war. It, it was a pretty, pretty graphic circumstance. Uh, and in any case, it was stressful. That might have not have been it, but it was maybe something comparable. Um, and basically what he identified was three phases of stress that occur over a period of time. Um, in most cases it's years. Um, and somewhere in that spectrum, we kind of all fall in mm -hmm. the modern age. Um, those are the initial alarm. So where we encounter a stress and it can be, you know, psychosocial it can be physical physical is usually more short term um although you know there are still sort of exceptions to that someone who's got a physical job and and has to make ends meet and is working with their body like 60 to 80 hours a week like that's stressful but then i think more more common in our modern age is prolonged protracted psychosocial stress you know and kind of overlapping with like an existential dilemma mm -hmm. um so that you know that occurs initially at some point and it it throws off our worldview we get thrown off by that and you know while we cope emotionally with those stresses thankfully the body you know in all of its wisdom that's evolved over billions of years um there's a response that's kind of on autopilot where we release a whole bunch of biological products, you know, in this case, deriving from the neuroendocrine system, like cortisol is our primary activator. Most people think of it as a stress hormone, um, which I don't think is terribly accurate. I mean, it's, it's what keeps us alive. Uh, it represents vitality, but when it becomes a runaway train, like that's obviously not desirable. Um, epinephrine and norepinephrine, those are Nature intended those to be more of a short-term solution, but cortisol and epinephrine have kind of a symbiotic reciprocal relationship, so um, they potentiate each other. If someone has elevated cortisol chronically, uh, there's a tendency for epinephrine and norepinephrine to catch up to that, and just mm -hmm. the baseline is higher. So that would be adaptation. Um so that's the first stage, right? There's well, a, a large segued. stressor yeah, the and alarm. there's an alarm and then we move on into the second stage right, of right. stress. And so that's those are those are byproducts of something that's happening higher upstream mm -hmm. um, at the brain centers, the hypothalamus and the pituitary. Um, so basically what's happening is that the the microscopic anatomy is sort of adjusting the receptor sites for cortisol. Um, are down-regulating. So 
basically the hypothalamus, which is kind of our thermostat, it, it loses its ability to properly register what's going on in the body. Um, so from that standpoint, habituating, you'll, you'll typically see people with not necessarily elevated cortisol, although that's, that's the case with many folks. Um, the sort of like diurnal secretion of cortisol alters to a point where it's, it's not desirable for a happy life. Mm. Um, can we actually stop there and talk about that diurnal yeah. uh, fluctuation of cortisol? Cause I think that's yeah. very fascinating that for some people, so you're technically, you're supposed to have a cortisol spike sometime in the morning. It's yeah. what gets you up, awakens you. And then towards later in the day, cortisol goes down and that's what lets you sleep. But some yep. people have it inverted where in the morning, their cortisol is, is low, is very low. Yeah. And at night it's very high. It so spikes. in the morning they feel groggy, they feel terrible, yep. tired. And at night, and then they, can't they feel wired and they can't sleep even though they right. feel tired. So can you speak a little well, bit yeah, more about Well, yeah, that's this? kind of that runaway train. I mean, um, like Bogdan was saying, at seven, something magical happens at 7 a.m. Um, our cortisol peaks, ideally, um, not in the example we just mentioned, but and also testosterone for men. And it mm-hmm. might even follow the same rhythm for women, although obviously women have more of a monthly cycle with their hormones. Mm-hmm. Um, but everyone has a, you know, a certain cyclical rhythm in the course of a day and also throughout the year. Um, there's a seasonal rhythm too. So macro, micro, you know, big rhythms, small rhythms. Um, and so 7 a.m., like we're flooded with a cascade of activating hormones, testosterone, cortisol, all sorts of good stuff. You get out the door, you start your day, you set your intentions, you get things done, you get right to it. Um, but we don't find that to be the case so much anymore. Um, people don't feel awake until 10 a.m. or even noon. And, you know, it takes them three cups of coffee to get there or, you know, some latte sugar bomb abomination um that's i mean (laughs) we we know those people um so yeah and then the the court the initial cortisol spike occurs more towards midday and then um they're just kind of random spikes with a tendency to being you know higher than conducive to healthy sleep when we retire um and you know we can we can go down that rabbit hole: blue light, noise pollution, mm-hmm. too much work, too many stimulating subjects late at night, and psychological stress too. Yeah. There's an interesting fact that some people, uh, the healthy response is you know there's a stressor, your cortisol goes up, your epinephrine, everything you need. Maybe you know it's a tiger chasing you. Probably not. It's probably just your boss. I mean, that's Um, only, that's like an India problem. Yeah. (laughs) That still does happen. People get eaten by tigers. I think it's like 30 people a year that get eaten by tigers in India. That's really, that's way (laughs) too many. Well, Uh, they're on the verge of extinction though. So I would honestly, maybe that's better off than them being extinct. Well, better that they don't eat people. Yes. um, Another rabbit hole. They need to go to vegetarianism (laughs) for sure. (laughs) Um, I wonder how we can splice that vegetarianism into adaptogens. I'm sure we'll find a way. Mm. Um, but then, so the, the third, um, chapter of the whole stress experience is burnout. Right. Uh, and that's when you're just out of gas. Um, you, you don't have the ability to produce cortisol in any meaningful amounts. Right. So that's like the depletion stage. You're depleted. Yeah. And there's mm-hmm. not much you can do at that standpoint. I mean, what I see a lot with the doctors that I'm working with is, uh, smaller doses of corticosteroids administered in the morning just to jumpstart that rhythm. And mm. then there are certain herbs that can um, help the body maximize that initial pharmaceutical input. Because that's, I mean, that's a big gun pharmacologically, mm-hmm. corticosteroids, and they are demonized. But back to what I said about cortisol being, you know, our vitality, representative of vitality to some degree, like, if you don't have it, you should all, all the people listening to this should look up Addison's like that is true adrenal depletion, adrenal fatigue. Right. It's, it's a consequence of autoimmunity destroying the adrenal glands. And those are some sad, sad people. And they basically require full cortisol replacement for the rest of their life or else their life will be miserable and you know, markedly shorter right. than the normal population. And that's at the end of the extreme. Addison's disease right. is like right. such a depletion of cortisol that they just can't even, you know, yeah. produce any. Hypotensive to the max, like blood pressure, like 
70 over 40 mm. you know it, your brain can't perfuse at that point mm. hypoglycemia just sheer misery mm-hmm. um so in you know in in those people's cases pharmacologic intervention is absolutely necessary right. um, but most people don't have that most, most people have what is more called adrenal fatigue which right. is which is really defined yeah. but hypothalamic dysregulation right it's I not it's hi, it's at, it's mm-hmm. happening higher up in the brain um, and then that being the case, because the hypothalamus via the pituitary influences a number of other endocrine glands, so the, the thyroid, the gonads, so ovaries and testes, depending upon, you know, your anatomy, um, the thymus, I mean, not so much later in life. Um, but yeah, I mean, that is that is sort of the thermostat for one's vitality. And when you... Right. When you're existing in that depleted state, it, I would imagine it feels pretty hopeless. Thankfully, I'm not there after eight years of grad school, but it's been these compounds that's helped me to preserve longevity, to preserve my optimism, to produ- preserve my productivity. Um, and right. it's, it's just been kind of like the ideal venue to experiment with all this because we're getting all this cool information from our curriculum. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I'm basically my own science experiment and for the most part successful. Um, well, let's talk about the individual compounds. Yes. So what are some of your go-to adaptogens and where do they fit in, in that yeah. kind of stress response picture? I, I would talk about rhodiola first. Mm-hmm. Um, and I say that because, you know, we're coming out of winter in the Northwest. Um, rhodiola is you know, better and better known these days. Um, Of all the adaptogens, of all the stress modulating compounds, botanical, nutraceutical, or otherwise, it seems to be the strongest as an antidepressant. Hmm. And particularly for people with melancholic depression, just low, we call it low positive affect, uh, and also seasonal affective disorder. So, and these studies were done in Siberia, in Russia, which makes our Pacific Northwest winters look like a Caribbean vacation. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's a hard ass winter to, mm-hmm. to live through. Yeah, uh, Bogdan's Ukrainian, so he probably knows better than I do. Um, but needless to say, so I put rhodiola to the test up in Seattle, which is like 180 miles north of Portland, mm-hmm. and it's you know you get 45 minutes less of daylight at the winter solstice and 45 more minutes of daylight at the summer solstice. Um, so that latitude actually is kind of a, it's, it's a pretty big discrepancy. Um, so I, I started taking rhodiola like first winter of my first year studying East Asian medicine. I felt awesome. It was great. I have not had an episode of seasonal depression once in eight winters in the Northwest coming from Colorado, which is like sun more than 300 days a year. That's remarkable. Yep. Even in the wintertime. Yeah. It so. gets pretty rough out here in uh, Portland when you don't see yep. the sun for like two months. And so, so we recommend vitamin D for basically everyone. Like everyone just should be taking vitamin D out in the Northwest. Cause realistically we don't spend enough time outside no matter who we are, even if we're active people. Um, so let's say you're staying indoors 22 hours of the day in the dead of winter in the Northwest, like your vitamin D is cratered basically. And what vitamin, how vitamin D adds up to alleviating seasonal affective disorder, vitamin D is integral for the production of catecholamines. So dopamine, epinephrine, norepinephrine, um, which, you know, if we're secreting those at a healthy rate in a healthy amount, those are our feel good hormones. Mm -hmm. Um, and what rhodiola does is a really nice job of modulating those, bringing them more to an ideal. So it's it's working on an acute basis, whereas you would have to take vitamin D, you know, for several weeks to really notice an effect because your system would have to replete with it. And in, in a lot of cases, like remedy a deep deficiency. Um, but you can take rhodiola and you'll start to feel the effects probably within a half hour, realistically. It's very energizing. Um Rhodiola combined with caffeine is often too much for a lot of people. Some people, I I love that combination. I get a lot done and I feel awesome. And I've set a lot of personal records in the gym with rhodiola, particularly with, um, you know, more cardio oriented stuff. Mm. Um, But yeah, you just, uh, you have, 
the lungs of a horse and you're in a great mood, you can focus. Um, it helps with verbal fluency, memory input and output. Um, what else can I say about that? And, and to say that it modulates catecholamines is kind of an understatement. It also modulates serotonin, which isn't a mm. catecholamine. It's a monoamine. So I guess that would be the more accurate description of what it's doing. And it also does a really nice job of stabilizing cortisol. Mm. And it's an adaptogen, you know, in that sense, like it'll raise you to a higher baseline if necessary, lower you to a lower baseline if necessary, and just keep that supply of energy in the form of blood sugar nice and stable as much as it can be. Mm. Um, so to address seasonal effective for athletic performance enhancement. Mm. Um, and in terms of other adaptogens, the way that I think of rhodiola uh, and the, what the research shows is that it's one of the fastest acting. Yep. I think in some of these research studies, they showed that it kind of it goes into effect in about 30 minutes mm -hmm. and it has notable um, effects on cognition, improvement, yep. uh, improving endurance, improving uh, athletic activity, um, and basically hardying the body and the minds to stress, being yeah. able to adapt in to stress. In case you're living in a Siberian adaptogen. winter. Exactly. And the thing is about It's very these, stimulating too. Yeah. Very stimulating. Definitely on the stimulating the side. Um, yeah, and, and our... Herbalism professor kind of she put these adaptogens on a nice little spectrum for mm -hmm. us um, And I think Bogdan and I are pro both like visualizing that spectrum. Mm -hmm. So rhodiola is definitely towards the end of stimulation um, But then like where it comes from you got to think of of the the phytochemistry that's affecting people in that way those compounds are basically defense mechanisms. They are to preserve the viability of the plant organism in Siberia in the wintertime. So. Right, and to help the plant itself adapt right. to harsh conditions, yep. which is kind of the way I like to view herbs too. Is And I've said this before many times. I think it's such a great idea. It's worth repeating that when you ingest a plant, you're basically – taking in its evolutionary adaptation. Yep. I mean, you're taking in its uh, the chemicals that it uses to, you know, fight off microbes, to fight off, you know, pathogens, to fight off negative environment. And of course, plants are different than animals, but still, to some amount, we can benefit from their adaptations. Yeah. So rhodiola is one of those really hardy plants because it has to live in very dire situations, very cold situations. Yes, yeah, it's a tough, fibrous root. Um, and I'm looking, I have this nice reference book to my right here. Uh, the diversity of compounds, you know, amongst this mm -hmm. category of herbs is pretty wide. And I think in rhodiola's case, it's mostly phenolic compounds, phenolic glycosides, mm -hmm. um, which is partially why it smells so nice. It does kind of smell like rose and another mm -hmm. name that it's known by is rose root. But I guess like big picture, we evolved you know, we met these plants halfway. Mm -hmm. Our livers are evolved to metabolize these organic compounds that weren't created in a lab that have been around, you know, longer than we've been a species. Mm -hmm. um, our livers have had to develop based upon taking these in. And that's partially why the half-life for a lot of these adaptogenic compounds that are naturally occurring are substantially shorter than pharmaceutical counterparts. Um, so when making that segue, rhodiola is often compared to bupropion because bupropion mm. is it's an antidepressant. It's a, an atypical one in that it's just working on dopamine and norepinephrine. Um, and it's, it's prescribed for smoking cessation. By the way, rhodiola is great for nicotine withdrawal. Hmm. Because it is modulating those fundamental neurotransmitters that are all out of whack when someone is trying to quit tobacco, hmm. uh, quit nicotine, um, you know, from any standpoint. Um, so, yeah, rhodiola often gets called nature's bupropion, um, which, you know, I make that point because probably not the best things to mix because they're working on the same system and, and that sort of overlap can be really, really dangerous. So... You know, that sort of statement that I make does sort of um, hint at the necessity for folks who want an expert opinion to really consult a naturopathic physician because this mm -hmm. is this is kind of our bailiwick. This is, you know, our 
not our intellectual property, but it's our area of expertise. Um, and when, mm -hmm. you know, we're advised to consult our doctors about taking an herb, like conventional doctors don't receive this training. You're not going to get, you're going to yeah. get a biased opinion against the herbs. I um, definitely agree. And if anything, naturopathic physicians in general are over cautious right. when using herbs. Yeah, so it's, true. it's, it's pretty, pretty safe because obviously we studied the different interactions and it's interesting though, because a lot of the interactions are theoretical, right? They're just like this That's where true. it's like, it works in the same system. So Therefore, maybe it could be risky, dangerous. but in actual cases of, you know, adverse events, they're either just not researched or non-existent, but doesn't mean you shouldn't be careful because herbs are also medicines. They tend to be more mild medicines in general. They tend to be less toxic in general, but that doesn't mean that all of them are less toxic. doesn't mean that all of them are harmless, especially once you start getting into high doses and you start mixing yeah. them with other things. So it's just going to say to, you know, get a licensed practitioner to help you out with finding which herbs are best for you. Because with these adaptogens specifically, um, it's not necessarily the best thing to just take every adaptogen. There's one that one or two that are better suited for the particular kind of thing that you have. And going back to that conversation about like the cortisol rhythms, a lot of that has to do with that. It's like, how is the HPA access or that stress response system dysfunctional in us? And it's differently dysfunctional in different mm -hmm. people. And it requires a different adaptogen. And rhodiola is one of those adaptogens that are for the last stage in the stress response when you're just completely depleted and you just need something to kind of like spark you up. Um, theoretically speaking, if you're in the first part of the stress adaptation stage where you're, you know, you're just stressed out and you're kind of really anxious, but you have a lot of energy, it could actually add to that. Like mm -hmm. some people say that it can cause like anxiety. I haven't never yeah. had that experience, but theoretically um, it matters where in the stress response you are. Like, are you just stressed out all the time and really high energy? Are you adapting well? Or are you just like, you've been stressed out for so long that you can't even get out of bed in the morning. You Now you don't even have stress. You're just completely dead. Yeah. That's where it's you, mostly used for. It's like a emergency kind of thing. But you can also use it as like a tonic every day. Yep. Um, so rhodiol is a good one. It's one of my favorites. And on that point, um, let's talk about dosing for the people yes. who, who want to experiment under the supervision of someone competent. Um, mm -hmm. A typical dose is if I would just recommend an extract. It's inexpensive, definitely not a cost prohibitive herb. Mm -hmm. You can get it on Amazon. There's a lot of good brands. Just look around for the price point that works for you. Um, but the general recommendation is between 250 and 500 milligrams a day. Mm. You can dose that all at once. You can split it up. You can, you know, open up a capsule and sprinkle out the powder. You get to know the taste. It's very tannic. Mm -hmm. um, very stringent, kind yeah, of dry yeah. flavor. Um, and then it's got that odor of rose, too. So that's kind of a cool way to experience the herb. I mean, it's definitely an acquired taste. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, just to so that you have options with dosing. A lot of the products that I've noticed nowadays are extract, standardized extract to three and 1% respectively of the active compounds, the um, rosavins and the solido rosides, I think they are. Um, so yeah, that, that's what to look for. Uh, if you get in a tincture format, you I would recommend maybe two and five milliliters a day. So, you know, that's like most of a dropper full is a milliliter. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it's not one that you want to take later in the day. I mean, especially for first time usage, you should it can probably be pretty stimulating. It can be stimulating. Noticing yeah. like I, a cup I, of coffee kind of right. deal. I never take it past noon. Mm -hmm. Otherwise I'll just stare at the ceiling all really? night when I'm trying to down. fall asleep. It's interesting. Yeah. Rhodiol is one of the, one of the go-tos, a great example of like the potential power of a yep. adaptogen it is certainly powerful. Um, and just to kind of zoom out. So adaptogens, from my understanding, they help us adapt to stress. They help our body kind of resist stress and overcome it in a more efficient way. And they do that through all sorts of mechanisms from altering how cortisol rhythms work, cortisol level, blood sugar, catecholamines, neurotransmitters, yeah. uh, neurotransmitters, as you were saying. And then, of course, modulating the HPA axis, which is a really important concept to understand. So just very generally, and we can talk a little bit more about this. Um, the HPA axis is the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. Yeah. And 
in most general terms, it's how your brain, consciousness, nervous system are wired into your adrenals so that your body can adapt and secrete the necessary amount of adrenaline and cortisol when it's needed. Because we don't only secrete stress hormones like cortisol for um, physical stresses, like something like low blood sugar could cause the release of cortisol, um, but also for perceived psychological stress. Mm -hmm. And we live in a we live in a world where we're psychologically stressed on so many things. Yeah. You know, there's a deadline. If you've ever had that feeling of like you think of something due and you feel like your heart, you feel in your heart, you feel your heart start to race a little bit. That's like a secretion of those because it's to that perceived stress, you know, a little bit of epinephrine gets secreted. Yeah. Um, but what these herbs help us to do in general, the belief is, is to kind of smooth that process out and make it a little bit more robust and make it a little bit more ad too. adaptive. So yeah. like the cortisol goes up, but it also goes down when the stress is overcome. Mm -hmm. For some people, it just goes up, then it goes up, then it goes up, then it goes up. They never get any rest and eventually they're just completely depleted. And that's like when you start getting into like adrenal exhaustion or adrenal fatigue, which as we were mentioning before is really more of an HPA dysfunction. Yeah. Uh, meaning this system is out of whack. Uh, yeah. Because as there is insulin sensitivity, there also is cortisol sensitivity, right. which is a whole nother can of worms to get into. And that's into. far less understood than insulin insensitivity. Right. And it's related to insulin right. sensitivity too. Yeah, so yeah, everything is love. linked in the body. Um, so Should we what, talk a little bit about that? The limbic system involvement with all yeah, this? Yeah, sure. I think that's pretty pretty interesting. Yeah, so neuroscience. I, I think people should understand it um, since we're on the subject. So what Bogdan was saying, what we perceive as stress is going to vary from person to person. Mm -hmm. It's, it's going to relate to our life experience and our memories. Um, and as we were talking about, like kind of, you know, crafting the structure for this podcast, um, there are certain personality types that just, they don't gel, you know, and I, I think that we can all identify those pretty easily. So imagine, and you probably had this boss who's just like fundamentally at odds with who you are. Your communication styles are different. You value different things. Um, you're aspiring to certain things that are completely diametrically opposite to what they want out of you as an employee. And just you know, getting into work in the morning is a stressful experience because you encounter this particular person and they just suck the life out of you. Mm. And you likely sat in traffic on the way to work, which was stressful. Um, you get out of work, you get back in traffic, you turn on the news, like the story of the world these days sucks. So, and then maybe you watch something on Netflix that involves explosions or like people getting chopped up with swords so or you watch black mirror and you just become very depressed <laughs> i've had that experience so that's, that's <laughs> some everyone's quotation experience or not everyone's but it's a lot of people's quotation experience these days um and so depending upon who we are as people what our story is what our likes and dislikes are um that'll catalyze a stress response you know, we, we intake things through our sensory organs. You know, we're highly visual as creatures, also verbal secondarily. Um, so then that all that input is processed by cortical areas like the occipital cortex, the auditory, etc. cetera. Um, and so we have an image of, say, a tiger. We don't know that it's a tiger and, until we involve the hippocampus where... You know, that's kind of our library repository for memories. So we have this image of this large orange feline that is a tiger. You know, oh, oh crap, alarm bells ring because the hippocampus says this is a very, very dangerous thing. And from so the, past experiences, maybe right. things you've heard about tigers, from maybe that one experience you had at the zoo. Et cetera, I think et it's cetera. evolutionary too. I it's mean, probably hardwired like too. Saber tooth cats, like these are miniature saber tooth, <laughs> which is crazy to think about because they wow. were like eight hundred pounds. Jesus. Um, so then the next stop is, um, in this case, the amygdala, which is it's part of the the limbic system. The limbic system is really the mammalian brain. So mm -hmm. you have the amygdala, which is like the angry tiger slash the frightful deer or human that's trying to evade the angry tiger. It's like the urgency of survival. 
and then the the inula or the insula, sorry, is the um, like the snuggly like kitten or puppy or whatever. It's our mammalian bonding. Um, so there's two sides to that coin, but um, as far as stress goes, the amygdala is far more involved, and then the insula is you know oxytocin driven, and that is a huge stress relief that we're missing largely in our culture. Mm-hmm. Um, that so, comes from physical touch, contact, yeah, love, yeah. these kind and of things. And that's that's immediately stress relieving. That's one of the biggest um, and and most acute ways to mm-hmm. lower and balance cortisol is physical touch. Mm-hmm. Um, so take some rhodiola and go to one of those like um, and hug paid hugging things. Yeah, yeah. Just, you know, volunteer, <laughs> or better, hug volunteer a to hug free. people. Right, right, exactly. Free hugs. Um, so then the the amygdala is joined to the hypothalamus um, by way of the nucleus accumbens, which is it's a dopaminergic, meaning it relies on dopamine um, conduit between the two structures. So you know you have this stimulus from the amygdala that puts the hypothalamus on high alert and then basically the whole like hormonal cascade that Bangad and I were talking about earlier that occurs from there. Um, so yeah, I mean, stress, stress is partially universal and, Mm. and it's personal. And then, you know, what herb is right for certain people. Another thing that we wanted to touch on is like what's constitutionally appropriate Mm -hmm. in terms of herbs. We've just talked about rhodiola so far, but it's, it's energetically warm and it's dry. That's how it's looked at in Chinese medicine. Um, so really like by contrast, the, the sort of person that we would recommend this to is someone who's more phlegmatic, which is that's Greek medicine, but cold and damp. So mm. how do you how do you determine if you're cold or hot as a constitution? Well, do you prefer warmth or do you prefer cold? Mm-hmm. You're going to prefer what you need. So a person who's a cold constitution is going to likely prefer heat. They're not going to like winter time. They're going to like summer. Um, and do you do you run dry or moist? I mean, that's kind of evident from like skin turgor or craving for beverages like cool beverages or do you crave saltine crackers something to absorb any sort of excess moisture Mm. in the body um so just looking at those tendencies you can kind of surmise what's like constitutionally Mm. appropriate from herb to person and vice versa right so on that train of thought let's keep going through some of the other big hitter uh, adaptogens because rhodiola is definitely i would say it's in the holy trinity of adaptogens if there was one right i would agree with that Another one is Eleuthero, um, mm-hmm. also known as Siberian ginseng. So there was this weird law that came out of a debate between like the Wisconsin American ginseng farmers, and they were all up in arms about calling this thing a ginseng. And it's kind of in that family, like a, a broader family, but Eleuthero is the name by which it's more correctly known these days. Um, but Siberian ginseng is probably what most people know it by. Mm. Um and it comes from, you know, very similar habitat to rhodiola. It's harsh Siberian climate. I think it grows further east, generally speaking. I think rhodiola is more central um, in terms of, like, the region that it thrives in. Um, but Eleuthero is another, you know, hardy, fibrous, tough root. Um, and it's, it's basically the quintessential adaptogen. If, mm. you, if you have no experience with these compounds... Eleuthero would be a good place to start because it's really well tolerated by very just mild. about everybody. Now, I, I wouldn't say that it's mild. In uh, terms of like not very sedating and not like very stimulating, not like rhodiola. You can definitely get you feel wired. It. Yeah, but I mean, it's... And not like ashwagandha, which is like really like... Sedating. Damping, s- sedating. Yeah. Makes you sleepy, actually. Yep. Yeah, I mean, Eleuthero is potent for sure. And mm. I would say that I, I notice almost identical physical effects hmm. um, when I'm training under the influence of Eleuthero or Rhodiola. You know, truthfully, I combine both, and that, that yields a pretty awesome workout. Um, but in terms of really preserving and maintaining homeostasis, which is, you know, that, that balance point physiologically, um, Eleuthero has been determined to be really the best at that in terms of stabilizing cortisol, even better than rhodiola. Uh, and also, you know, hypertension versus hypotension, blood pressure high versus low. You know, there's a certain ideal so that our organs perfuse, 
you know, optimally, particularly the brain. Um, and blood pressure has to be at a sweet spot in order for that to happen. And then blood sugar as well. So providing our brain with fuel, you know, indefinitely, um, it shines in that capacity as well. And also preserving energetic reserves like glycogen, for instance. So we have this storage repository in the liver for backup fuel. Uh, and that's where a lot of our energy is being generated from, not to get into the chemistry of that. Um, but Eleuther is just kind of right in the nice, sweet middle spot. Um, women can take it. Men can take it. Um, it would probably be way too much for kids because they have a lot of energy to begin with mm -hmm. and they're not, you know, they haven't encountered significant stress yet. There's a few good adaptogens for children. I don't know if we'll get that today. Um, but yeah, it's, and, and for that reason, because it is in the middle, I feel like it gets unfairly overlooked. Um, you can take it for long periods of time mm -hmm. too months at a time um it's always good to take a break from particular herbs just to let your body desensitize to their input mm -hmm. okay yeah. so we got rhodiola so far we got uh luthero which is siberian ginseng what are some other adaptogens that you think are particularly useful uh for adapting to stress i mean you you brought up an the idea of a holy trinity mm -hmm. um and you kind of hinted at where i would go next in terms of order so we started off with something pretty stimulating then we migrated to the middle and then on the sedating end is ashwagandha mm -hmm. which is coming out of the ayurvedic tradition and guess what it's another root um yeah it, all these are roots that's yep. very uh Interesting that yeah. that happens to be the case. Yeah, think about it. I mean, it's, you know, the core of the plant. It's where the nutrients get uptaken. Um, and if you if you compare it to the human body, it's like the lower energy centers. Like if we need to root energy, if we need to root resources, we're going to consolidate in the lower energy centers. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly where our adrenals are. They're yep. in our lower part of our body. Below the diaphragm. Lower meaning below the diaphragm. That's mm -hmm. kind of how we're looking at this anatomically. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, ashwagandha is in the nightshade family. So people who are sensitive to nightshades, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, um, you might want to approach this one with caution. Although a lot of people who are nightshade sensitive um, do find ashwagandha to be pretty tolerable. Mm. Um, the interesting thing is, well, it's so energetically, it's warm and moist. Um, and so therefore it would be best suited for cold and dry sort of constitutions. Mm -hmm. Um, it works primarily on acetylcholine, which is our parasympathetic neurotransmitter, um, sort of the rest and digest, feed and breed, relax um, state of affairs mm -hmm. that is really our ideal as a species. Like ideally we'd be spending most of our day as such. Uh, and that's where we truly heal organs. I mean, that's partially why we have such an epidemic of chronic health diseases these days is because we can't access the parasympathetic state as we're supposed to evolutionarily. Uh, and ashwagandha helps to bring us there by working on acetylcholine. It preserves it particularly. It inhibits the enzyme that breaks it down, um, which is basically the the mechanism of action for Alzheimer's drugs is to preserve mm. acetylcholine. So in that respect, it's also a cognitive enhancer mm. uh, and also something that remedies anxiety to a degree and anxiolytic. Um, it's working on, you know, a myriad of neurotransmitters. It's increasing GABA. It's, and this has a more lowering effect on cortisol. So for people who are already depleted, it's probably not a good choice, but people who are earlier uh, in the stages. So it's a way to explain it that I like to think of it uh, in terms of the uh, cortisol patterns analogy. So certain people who have, you know, very, very high cortisol spikes in the morning or me maybe even early morning. These are people who, you know, they're sprung awake at six in the morning, even if, um, you know, they went to bed at 2 a.m. They just start suddenly awake and they can't go back to sleep. So these kind of people that have this very high cortisol level in the morning, they're the types that are most likely to benefit from ashwagandha because ashwagandha kind of levels that out and can lower that. Now, optimal. Exactly. So for somebody who 
is like a high cortisol spike in the morning, if they take rhodiola in the morning, it might be too much. Right. Yeah. And, and what you mentioned previously about being awake at 2 a.m. So ashwagandha is said to improve sleep if you take it during the day. Take it during the day so that you have mm. a nice calm day and that you can sleep at night. And the fact that it um, elevates GABA, which is our primary sedating neurotransmitter, um, GABA and cortisol kind of have a reciprocal relationship where if one is high, the other has to be low. Um, and part of like the bigger picture of insomnia nowadays is that cortisol is too high to allow for proper conversion of 5-HTP to melatonin. Mm. So melatonin is highly dependent upon cortisol being low when you retire and then having you know healthy levels of GABA throughout the day will help that conversion occur when it's meant to through, mm. you know. Millennium. And I've actually noticed with ashwagandha, when I first started experimenting with it uh, in undergrad uh, to kind of help with like stress response and things like that. Um, also, it was kind of very popular, very faddish at the time. And it is now. And for good reason, because it's been used for works. a very long time uh, yeah. in Ayurveda. Uh, but what I noticed is I would take like a big spoonful of the powder which is about maybe like three to five grams. And I would like take it in the morning and I would just be like, whoa, I'm like really sedated and kind of sleepy actually. Yeah. So that's maybe, I don't know what your view is on using adaptogens at certain times of the day, but I would think ashwagandha would be better either in like small doses throughout or yeah. better like uh, towards like the later hours because it's a little bit more like sedating. So more like nighttime yeah, stress I, response. I save it for afternoon um, mm. I wouldn't necessarily, because I usually work out in the afternoon. So me taking ashwagandha at like somewhere between noon and 2 p.m., I find that I'm not too energized when it comes time to sleep, but I have a boost in the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Or I, I'm where I want to be, I guess, is more mm. accurate to say. And there's some the really cool day. research with ashwagandha specifically of um, being used by athletes, yeah, in increasing kind of athletic uh, ability, and also I believe increasing muscle mass gains over mm -hmm. periods of time. They say it makes you strong like a horse. Yep, it's kind of where it gets its name from. Uh, I think something like horse smelling or horse something like sweat. That. Yeah, horse sweat. Yeah. Well, we we touched on ashwagandha with the men's health podcast, mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if I referenced the study specifically ashwagandha is one of the most reliable testosterone boosters mm. for men and for women um, and it was not to go into the details um, of the study but basically it brought the mean sample of guys who were averaging about 550 to about 750 mm. so a 200 point increase and then you know doing the math there that's like a 40 percent increase roughly so it was certainly significant, um, and that was and five fifty is like kind of within the middle range. These weren't testosterone deficient mm -hmm. hypogonadal dudes; mm -hmm. um, these were normal guys. But then it brought them to the upper range of normal, like where we would see with testosterone replacement therapy. Mm -hmm. um, so then, you know, you you were mentioning that you were taking about three to five grams of a powder daily. Like that's mm -hmm. that's considered a pretty typical dose if it's powder. Um, if it's an extract like 4 to 1 or 10 to 1, you would adjust accordingly. If you're going to go standardized, I'm just a fan of standardization or standardized products mm. um, because you know, it takes guesswork out of the equation to a degree. Um, and normally what you would see there is between like 500 to 1,000 milligrams. The typical standardization runs from like 2.5 to 4.5%. Mm -hmm. of the withanolides. Those are the active compounds. Um, so yeah, it's it's the anabolic steroid of Ayurvedic medicine. And being that it works on acetylcholine, acetylcholine is also um, a factor in how hard a muscle can contract. So not to get into the physiology too much, but basically more calcium release allows the actin and myosin to do their little ratcheting thing mm -hmm. and to do so with more strength. And I... I'm guessing a lot of, or at least some of the people listening to this podcast who do train, you've maybe used creatine or you're familiar with what creatine does. Um, it's a pretty appreciable strength increase that you get from ashwagandha. At, on an acute dose, 
kind of approaching like a typical maintenance dose of creatine. So you will see mm. an approachable increase in strength and then kind of consummate to that over time, you would see an increase in muscle mass from the mm. increased androgens. Um, but also it helps you absorb your food because you're in that parasympathetic state. You're secreting more digestive acid. Thus, it's warm and moist. Back to that energetic um, component of it. It's mm. it's putting us in that warm, happy place. Um, yeah, and uh, ashwagandha is one of those adaptogens that has been uh, extensively studied and theorized to be kind of specific to balancing out the HPA axis. Yep. It downregulates the cortisol receptors. Mm-hmm. So it makes like your body less sensitive to those stress responses, which can be really helpful if you're always yeah. being bombarded by unnecessary hormone. Also, there's a study that showed it was helpful for hypothyroid yep. people. And that Mild makes sense because there's like a HPT axis right. also, like a, a hypothalamic pituitary thyroid yeah. axis. So th- basically all these like neuroendocrine systems of the body, they're all very integrated and they have a lot even to do with our mind and our psyche, which is interesting. Yep. That's kind and of rhodiola the interface and of the body. And too have that same, a similar mm-hmm. effect. All of them, I think, are working on helping to convert T4 to T3. So mm-hmm. the, the inactive form of thyroid hormone to the active form. Um, that's what we see happening with these adaptogens influencing thyroid secretion. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to segue to an herb called holy basil, Mm -hmm. which I don't feel like is appropriately respected or renowned as an adaptogen. Um, I remember Dr. Weeman, she's our herbalism professor, um, going through all of these herbs one at a time, and she brought up this pretty universal sort of study format to measure the efficacy, the potency of particular adaptogens. Uh, And they compared them to like pharmaceutical counterparts like amphetamine. Mm -hmm. Um, And what they did was they would take, I forget if it was a mouse or a rat. This study has been repeated a bunch of times. Um, So rodents in either case. So they take the little rodent and they put them in water and they let them swim. And swim and swim indefinitely. So they, they let the mouse tread water, you know, and the survival instinct kicks in. And, you know, those demands are put on the cardiovascular, the cardiopulmonary system, the muscular system. Like there's a certain component of psychological stress. Like this little mouse is swimming for its life all of a sudden. Um, and so depending upon how long the mouse could tread water and then they would sink. But then, you know, the study, the researchers were nice enough to like pull them out of the water before they drowned. Um, so no one needs to worry about that, but the <laughs> no animals were harmed in these studies no, except psychologically. Probably. Yeah. They were probably damaged a little <laughs> bit psychologically. Well, they did have adaptogens given to them. So <sighs> lucky guys. And actually the, adap- so amphetamine, um, actually performed below baseline because basically like it burned up their energetic reserves really, really quick. They Mm. swam really, really hard for a short amount of time. And then, you know, just compared to a control where they had no pharmaceutical or phytochemical enhancement, um, that was the control group. Best of all, and this study looked at ashwagandha, rhodiola, eleuthero, panax, ginseng, a number of others. Holy basil was actually the winner. Mm. The rats swam the longest with holy basil. And it's a, it's in the basil family. It's an osimum. Um, this is another treasure of Ayurvedic medicine. And it's called holy basil because the potency is so revered that it's considered almost a spiritual entity. Um, a lot of Orthodox Hindus wouldn't even remotely consider consuming it internally. What they do is they just kind of commune with the plant. They hang out in its presence. They say prayers for it, you know, have some sort of spiritual dialogue absorbing uh, its energy and medicinal benefits, you know, through sort of spiritual osmosis rather than brewing it as a tea like we do and taking it internally. Uh, But that's, that's the format that's considered to be pharmacologically appropriate. Um, And being it's, so it's, it's a flower and a leaf and it's very, very light. And if you're going to make a tea out of it, um, you're going to use maybe three to five grams a day. But if you measure that out, it's going to, it's going to look like a lot more than that because it's basically just 
dehydrated and plant matter. Mm-hmm. Um, so very, very light and airy. And it's not expensive. Um, you can get it from companies like Mountain Rose Herb. Uh, they have three varietals of it. It smells amazing. Um, very floral, very pleasant. But in terms of... We ha- we, we've established the physical performance enhancing benefit of holy basil with the rat swim test. And I can corroborate that it is a performance enhancer to, I, I would put it on par with rhodiola, eleuthera, and ashwagandha. I don't, I didn't notice that was any better. Um, but in terms of another very potent antidepressant, uh, I would even put this higher than rhodiola in terms of how it elevates the mood. And it can, I've seen it bring people back from very, very deep, deep depression, dark existential places. Um, it almost, my experience personally, I would describe it as like feeling world peace or inner peace, like world peace has been achieved in the world outside of me and I'm feeling good about things. It's really just, it takes away all worries. Mm. Uh, and it also is incredibly clarifying and that's sort of the effect therapeutically that Ayurvedic medicine notes is that it's clarifying it's um it's vaporizing like dense and turgid um aspects of pathology like mentally and physically like taking that and sublimating it Mm. to a lighter you know more ephemeral um state of matter and so it has that effect on consciousness. It's just basically like clearing up brain fog, clearing up the cobwebs, um, and you feel fantastic. Mm-hmm. And, and that's one of the adaptogens that's actually more typically considered to be a nootropic yeah. herb. And that's uh, a topic we'll actually save for a further podcast because right. that's that's a whole um, thing in and of itself. Um, but nootropic herbs in general are herbs that help the functioning of the mind. They help with cognition, Mm -hmm. memory, uh, some really common ones that people probably know of. Obviously, ashwagandha, bacopa is another popular one. Lion's Uh, mane. Lion's mane, kind of the different um, nervous system supporting uh, fungi. Mm -hmm. A lot of fungi, reishi mushroom too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, adaptogens, they cover a lot of bases. Rhodiola is a great, I mean, all of the ones that we talked about are cognitive enhancing to, to one degree or another. I mean, they have, you know, nuances mm. applicable to each of them. Well, that makes sense that that would be the case, right? Because um, from the understanding of um, neuroscience, we have many different kind of layers to our brain. Yeah. And the most outer layer, the neocortex, which is the layer that's really... Um, Functional during like higher level thinking, executive cognition, function, yeah. reflecting on yourself, yep. um, self actualization, being able to be like aware of your own emotions and overcome them, being able to be aware of stress and kind of calm yourself down. Those functions are shut down in uh, times of acute stress. Yep. That's why, you know, when someone's really stressed out, they have a really hard time thinking, they feel like they have brain fog. And these adaptogens that help your body better adapt to stress, it would make sense that, you know, if you can calm the body and the stress response down a little bit, then it frees some room for some, you know, higher level thinking that can um, allow you to perceive a way out of your situation mm-hmm. or perceive that your stress is um, not as bad as you thought yeah. it would be. And there's a big difference. This is a kind of um, interesting fact, but stress affects us differently. Not everything is bad stress. There's also good stress. Um, so we need stress in our lives. It, a stress is basically a challenge is put to your, either to your mind or your body and your body responds and your mind responds in a certain way. Depending on how we perceive that stress though, is how our body responds. So when we go to the gym and we lift weights, although it's very stressful in the body, we perceive it as good and we don't feel stressed out by working out. In fact, we feel better. But, you know, if you're forced to, you know, march somewhere or something terrible like that or like a forced (laughs) swim test, you're not going to perceive it as exercise and fun, but you're going to have a very bad internal psychological experience, even though it's the same physical activity. Right. So it's all in how you perceive the stress. And I think these herbs kind of help with the perception aspect, too. And I feel like for a lot of people, they're looking for a way out of a particular situation. And our expectation, you know, nowadays of medicine is that there's a pill that's going to yield a quick, basically instantaneous fix. And with regard to something so systemic as stress adaptation, we really, I mean, we have benzodiazepines, we have antidepressants, we have, you know, stimulants like Adderall and Ritalin, um, but they're not, 
they're not really nourishing what needs to be nourished. And I, I'm not saying that these adaptogens are going to solve an individual's problems or the world's problems, but like Bogdan was saying, it's it may help some people to you know achieve that observer percep- percep- perspective um, where you can sort of rationalize a stressful situation and creatively think a way out of it. Right, and think of the kind of positive aspects yeah. for it. And that's kind of um, where things like purpose and meaning in your life come in because uh, there's this saying that a person with a purpose can basically endure any kind of stress if it's moving at least towards that purpose. So if you have a goal to do this and that, like we're both students at naturopathic medical school, if um, if we didn't have this belief that we really wanted to be physicians and help people, it would make it very much more difficult to adapt to the stress. But because we have this idea that we're working on something and that, you know, sometimes it's tiring and sometimes uh, our memory feels not as good as it should be, we still move forward. And in the end, we don't get run down. We don't get burnt out. And I think a lot of these uh, adaptogenic herbs are very well suited for the kind of burnout that follows this high thinking, high activity kind of common way of living in society these yep. days. Um, so as far as like tonic herbs go, they're one of my favorite classes of herbs because they're not like other herbs where you kind of have to use them for a specific purpose. Like, you know, this herb is really good for cough. That one's really good for immune. Right. They're more general vitality uh, enhancing and helping your body adapt to stress. I mean, who doesn't need help adapting to stress? It, it could always be helpful. And for some people, it could be pretty remarkable. And physical activity, boosting the body. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of stress management tools in our toolbox. For a lot of us, we just don't realize that. Yeah. Um, but these adaptogens can be remarkably convenient. Um, you know, this isn't really green allopathy that we're espousing. Um, whereas we have, you know, a pill for stress. Well, Really, in these cases, it's the closest thing that we do have right. as a pill for stress. If there was a pill for stress, it would probably be meditation in a pill, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, that's why we're going to talk about nootropics next. Yes, and those are we'll very helpful there. for putting yeah. the mind in a certain state to like improve memory, cognition, and focus enough to actually be able yeah. to meditate and I kind of calm down fair. that monkey mind. Yep. Luckily, a lot of these adaptogens are also in that category, but we'll definitely save that very juicy... Uh, discussion of nootropics for the next topic yeah (laughs) all right uh grady thank you for being uh on the show really appreciated your extensive herbal knowledge i always love geeking out about some some herbs with you man yep until next time until next time thank you good sir